good evening. I'm very pleased to be here. I would like to thanks uh, to express my thanks to organizers, especially to uh, Peter and uh, his colleagues. Um, I, I'm very glad that the center is so active, and uh, I must say that it seems to be the center of giant studies in the world at present for the last couple of years. So it, uh, that makes me even happier to be uh, at this uh, meeting. Before I speak about the beginnings of what I consider beginnings of Jainism, uh, I should perhaps say a few words about the books which are on the display there. Uh, they have been just published. Uh, one of them reached me a week ago, another reached me a month ago. So you might be interested, one is a volume of uh, a 14th volume of Encyclopedia of Indian Philosophies. It's a volume uh, dedicated to Jainism, and another publication is on worldview and philosophy, uh, worldview and theory in Indian philosophy. There's also a small booklet which you uh, might be interested in. It's uh, Jainism and the definition of religion, which is not only on Jainism, but basically it's on the phenomenon called religion, uh, and uh, it focuses on Jainism as an example. Uh, that book can be uh, ordered from Indian publisher. Um, I should switch to uh, my topic. Um, yeah. Um, Jain logic and epistemology. I will try to present what I think may have been beginnings of Jain thinking and uh, Jain philosophy. Uh, perhaps it may come as a surprise to everyone accustomed with Jain philosophy and Jain uh, emphasis on logic and rhetorics that it was not always the case. When we analyze early texts, uh, we basically find no mention of logic, logical discussions, no interest in epistemology, uh, which is in, in, in itself quite interesting and we might be puzzled why it all started. We may also be surprised to realize that Jainism probably was not an important religious tradition, not as important as we may think. Jainism is only mentioned once in Ashokan inscriptions, whereas Buddhism, of course, is mentioned all the time in every inscription by definition. But Ajivikas are mentioned three times in the inscriptions of Ashoka. Ajivikas are mentioned also by Kautilya in his Arthashastra, uh, a work probably which goes back to the second century BCE and has nothing to do with Chandragupta Maurya, as is a common belief in India. So that text nowhere mentions Jainism, whereas it does mention Ajivikas and, of course, Buddhists. I will be talking a lot about uh, this tradition of Ajivikas and uh, one of its founders, uh, who, his name actually we don't know exactly. Probably his name was Goshala or Gosala. He's sometimes called Makhaliputta in Buddhist sources. Uh, Makhaliputta in, uh, sorry, uh, Makhali Gosala in Buddhist sources, uh, Gosala Makhaliputta or Makhaliputta in Jain sources. There are different versions. Sanskrit, na uh, his name in Sanskrit is Maskarin, very often Maskarin Goshala. We are not sure whether it's correct. That is not so important. But we will, I will, while talking about the beginnings of Jainism by Necessity, I will have to talk about the beginnings of Ajivikas because I will try to demonstrate that the relation of these two traditions was very complex and probably quite different from what we are used to now. The common belief is that Goshala was a kind of Sancho Panza of uh, uh, Mahavira. He was someone there, always 
getting himself into problems and then he was always saved uh, by uh, Mahavira. Mm. He's made fun of, fun of in the text. He's also portrayed as a disciple of Mahavira. In fact, he asks Mahavira three times to be accepted. Mahavira simply ignores him. And only on the fourth occasion, when, uh, he gets accepted by Mahavira. We also, when we deal with earliest Jain texts, we will find strong emphasis on ahinsa, on uh, ascetic conduct, there's no mention of epistemology. And it is a paradox that giants ended up with uh, debates on logic and epistemology. We are used to the term anekantavada, but the term also is relatively fresh. Probably it goes back to the sixth century uh, CE. It does not exist before. And this idea is not present in earliest, Buddhist, uh, in earliest Jain writings. While talking about the, the complex relationship uh, between uh, the Ajivikas and the Jains, I will mostly uh, refer to basically the only uh, longer account of the Ajivikas and of the founder of the Ajivikas, Gosala, which is Vihapanati, uh, one of the canonical books of the Jains. It's, and that book contains a chapter, chapter 15, uh, devoted to uh, Gosala. The title is uh, Teya Nisanga, which means the emission of firepower, simply because the context are different uh, duels with this uh, uh, yogic power when heat is emitted by one ascetic or another. When we go back again to the earliest history and earliest accounts of how Mahavira became an ascetic, probably the most important source of information, how it was transmitted, is Kalpa Sutra. And there we read a passage <clears throat> how Mahavira became an ascetic. Shramana Bhagavan Mahavira was with robes on for one full year and a month. That happened at the age of 30 when his parents died and he decided to leave his home and family and become an ascetic. Then he was devoid of cloth and used the hollow of his palm of his begging bowl. For slightly more than 12 years, Shamana Bhagavan Mahavira desisted from care of the body and for times exposed it to hardships. During this period, when any hardship came, he bore it in all respects, forgave it, overlooked it, and believed it to be no hardship whatsoever. Maybe due to divine wrath or caused by men, animals, or force of nature or by other adverse forces. These events, in fact, take place in the second year of ascetic career of Mahavira. So at the age of 30, he leaves his home. At the age of 32 plus, he renounces his clothes, becomes a naked ascetic, a chelaka, and he begins to eat directly from his hands. This is the giant account that is confirmed in other, on other occasions. Now, perhaps it's of interest that Kalpa Sutra, which devotes a lot of attention to how he leaves his home and to his later ascetic career, he does not mention anything what Mahavira did within that year, little more than a year, as an ascetic in the beginning. But interestingly, the moment when he gives up his clothes and becomes a naked ascetic, and the moment when he decides to eat directly, not from bowls, plates, or whatever, but directly from hands, coincides with the moment when he meets uh, Gosala uh, Manghaliputta. I refer to the description of that moment uh, in the other text, in the Bhagavati Sutra of Vihapanati. At that time, at that moment, after living uh, 
After living within my house for 30 years, when my parents reached divine status, that is, they died, I fulfilled my decision as follows. I took sacred robe and accepted tonsure, that is, I became bald, literally, and departed from home to homelessness. He became an ascetic. Then in the first year and a half month, I undertook penance for half a month, having remained in a village of uh, Asthigrama and stayed there for the first intermediate year year period. Then in the second year, I undertook penance for a month, wandering again and again. I have roamed from village to village until I reached Nalanda outside of Rajagriha, and I came to a weaver's workshop where I remained in a lonely spot in separation for an intermediate period. Then I stayed undertaking a month-long period. Then this Gosala Maskari Putta, who made his living from hand play with picture boards, being himself an itinerant bard, Wandering again and again, he has roamed from a village to village until he reached Nalanda outside of Rajagriha, when he came to Weaver's workshop where he deposited his ware tools in a lonely spot. When I don't have time to analyze this short text and show that basically it all took probably place within one year, not three years. Uh, the description actually speaks of months, not years and that would be confirmed elsewhere. Um, this is the, the way how they met. Finally, after many attempts, Mahavira accepts Gosala. Uh, the text also narrates how Gosala became naked. Uh, Buddhist sources also make up an ad hoc stories. Uh, Buddha Gosa, a commentator, Buddhist um, a commentator um, of one of uh, Buddhist uh, texts, Samanya Palasutta, describes such, such uh, made up stories like this one. Then Gosala did not see me in the weaver's shop. Gosala tried to meet Mahavira again, and he did not see Mahavira. He searched and looked for me everywhere inside and outside, uh, inside and outside of Rajagriha city. Not seeing my movement, my sneezing, my activity whatsoever, he set off to a weaver's workshop. After reaching it, he gave away his drape, upper gown, garment, bowl, utensils, and picture board to a Brahmin. He made himself an earthen pot with an elong elongated neck and left the weaver's workshop. So he, this is how the, uh, uh, Gosala is reported to become a naked uh, ascetic. However, in all other sources, he is depicted as a naked ascetic most of the time. The story, uh, some other stories will say that he worked uh, as a cheap labor and uh, he was accused of stealing, he was running away, the master tried to catch him, and this is, uh, he just got hold of, of Gosala's uh, clothes. Uh, Gosala managed to run away, and this is how he became naked. So he's, he and his nudity is ridiculed, both by Buddhists and Jains. Chronologically, however, this is quite interesting because the text shows that Gosala was still was naked before uh, actually he became a disciple of Mahavira, whereas Mahavira was at the time still wearing clothes. When we compare, and I don't have much time for that here, when you compare the events in the life of Mahavira and Gosala, there, are some, there is some coincidence. As you see, I take zero as the birth of Mahavira. We don't know when Gosala was born. He was definitely much older. Mahavira lived for 30 years as a, a householder. He completed his life as a householder, became an ascetic. Uh, he, was an, he spent 12 years as an ascetic before his jinnahood. Then, at the age of 31, after leaving the house, as I've said, uh, he completed his first year of asceticism. Then he met Gosala. Mm. He lives for six years in the company of Gosala. Or Gosala lives for six years with Mahavira, whatever. Then they part. Gosala, two years later, reaches his omniscience or jinnahood. Four years later, that's the same happens to uh, Mahavira. So again, it's quite peculiar because the sources will say that Gosala became omniscient two years before uh, Mahavira. It is 
probably Mahavira was around 39 or 40 when Gosala became omniscient. Mahavira reaches omniscience at the age four of 42. Gosala lives for 16 years longer until his death. Altogether, he, from the accounts, we, what we know, we, he spends 24 years as an ascetic. Mahavira lives longer, dies at the age of 72. Um, from elsewhere, for also from Jain sources, we know that Mahavi, uh, that Gosala, Makali Gosala, played an important role as a teacher uh, of, of Jain community. He is mentioned in one of the earliest works of Jains in the collection of different hymns, Isibhasiyam, the sayings of seers. Surprisingly, in that, in that um, collection, Gosala has his own section, whereas uh, Parshva, who plays much more important role in Jainism, has much smaller section, and his words, words ascribed to Parshva, are just in, uh, uh, an excerpt of a longer discourse. So when we analyze the contents of Isi Basiaim, we will see that Gosala at that time was given more attention than Parshva. Perhaps, with a big question mark, these might be the only semi-original words of Gosala ever preserved, because we have no mention of, or no account of Gosala anywhere else, and we have no traces of Ajivika works anywhere. On another occasion last year in Japan, um, during a seminar on fragments uh, from Indian philosophers, I gave a longer talk when I analyzed all possible uh, quotations ascribed to Ajivikas, and none of them proved original. All of them were composed with, with certain, certainty by either Buddhists or Jains or uh, some other writers. So basically, this is a tradition which disappeared completely from Indian so uh, soil. This is a text which basically does not say anything revealing. Uh, uh, I would say Gosala mentioned some banalities. These could be mentioned by anyone, uh, any ascetic. But what is important, he has his own important section that proves that he was considered, there was a period when he was considered a genuine Jain uh, representative or someone who was important for the Jains. This, is, this goes on and on. Um, now, surprisingly, we will find lots of points of interaction uh, between Jains and Ajivikas. We can reconstruct certain important uh, doctrines from quotations or reports, rather reports, on Ajivikas. And I will analyze these in order to demonstrate that the real relation between Gosala and Mahavira was the other way around than it was normally considered. I would claim that at least for some period of time, Gosala was the teacher of Mahavira. And then when Mahavira decided that he has something to tell when he gained in popularity, then probably the, both started to quarrel. That quarrel is depicted um, in the Bhagavati Sutra, in the Vyahaparnati. Uh, of course, in the light which, uh, with certainty, misrepresents Ajivikas and Gosala. This is the problem with this tradition of, uh, of the Ajivikas, that basically all we know about them always comes from staunch enemies of them, not even from someone who was neutral to the Ajivikas, but all these accounts come from Jains and Buddhists who, for different reasons, were very enemical to the Ajivikas and had no interest to represent them faithfully. Two of these influences have already been, been mentioned. Nakedness was always associated with the Ajivikas. It was much complex 
in the case of Jainism. So I would claim that it was not a coincidence that Mahavira gave up his clothes in the same year when he met Gosala. It was also not a coincidence that Mahavira began to eat the way the Ajivikas did. From Buddhist accounts, we can read that Ajivikas were ridiculed because they ate from hens and are often portrayed as those who lick their hands after meals. This is a clear indication that they ate from palms. This is a tradition still preserved in Jainism, of course. But originally, I would claim this was an Ajivikan tradition which was adopted by Mahavira. There are many other such traces uh, in Jain doctrine which come from the Ajivikas. Perhaps I should mention the first thing, that both Buddhist and Jain sources are unanimous in describing Gosala as Tirthankara, as Jina, uh, as someone who is a leader of a Garna, and Sangha, Garnin, Sangin. These are the terms used in both traditions. Of course, both traditions try to ridicule Gosala, but they admit that he had his following. Um, I will start this, this comparison of certain doctrinal points with a well-known doctrine in Jainism, the six uh, leshyas, the, the soul col colorings. This is something which has been noticed a few times before. Ajivikas are reported to have a doctrine of the so-called six abhijatis. Abhijati was uh, the color of humans, probably color of their souls. Um, and this basically overlaps with what we have with the Leshyas, except for gray and for uh, supremely white uh, in Ajivikas, but otherwise all colors match. The early, earliest descriptions of the Leshyas show that this term was understood in Jainism differently from what we are used to now. Simply, humans were given as examples. Uh, Mahavira would speak of the black Leshya as people who injure living beings those who contravene ahinsa. The blue are those who are full of greed and passion. Gray are those who are deceitful and are thieves. Yellow are those who are firm in controlling themselves. Some mendicants, ascetics. The white are those who have attained self-control. From the accounts, Buddhist accounts of what Abhijatis were, we find very similar descriptions. The black class, black Abhijati, these are hunters, butchers, murderers, thieves. Blue are mendicants known as bhikshu. Uh, the red are the mendicants known as nigandhas, the giants. Yellow are lay adherents of the Ajivikas. White are uh, Ajivika monks. And the supreme white are three, Nanda Vajcha, Kisa Sankicha, and Gosala Manghaliputta, that is the three teachers of the Ajivikas. But apart from that, the approach is basically very similar. So I would say this is one of additional influences. Of course, you can say it was the other way uh, round uh, that the doctrine of Leshyas influenced uh, the doctrine of Abhijatis of the Ajivikas. However, the Buddhists have no, the Buddhists uh, as neutral observers who were not always, uh, not always faithful, but they do not report anything on uh, Leshya, but they do report on Abhijatis. So they recognize Abhijati as uh, a concept related to the Ajivikas. Probably they would have, had they known the concept, of Lesha, they would have perhaps pointed out that the giants have the same idea. Of course, it's a rather weak argument, but my talk is based on weak arguments, when together, I would say they will make a stronger argument. It's a, it's a guess, uh, because all theories 
about the beginnings of Jainism are guesses, to the extent that even the identity of Jnatriputta, Nataputta, and Mahavira is questioned sometimes. The next point of coincidence is divination and uh, fortune telling, telling of the future, mm, foretelling of the future. Uh, we know that the Ajivikas had the scriptures called Mahanimitta, great omens, so books of great omens. They were eight of such books. Uh, later, comment giant commentators even give uh, titles of these books. They all are about divination. We can guess from the titles. Mankha, the name which is preserved in the epithet, uh, epithet of, of Makali Gosala, also suggests that he was such a wandering uh, fortune teller. Uh, he's always portrayed as someone in the commentary, someone who has a picture board and is telling stories. But probably these were, his activities were also related to fortune telling. We have uh, accounts from Buddhist sources, but also from, from later giant sources that Ajivikas made their living uh, from divination, horoscopes. They were known as those who could tell the future. Um, Mahavira himself rejected and was quite critical of divination, though in the course of time we find a very similar development in Jainism. The Jains got more and more involved in divination and that process ended up with a range of texts such as Angavidja, uh, that is well, a science of divination from signs, probably body signs. Um, interestingly, we also find uh, an emphasis in giant accounts on uh, Titi, on um, astronomy, uh, when we read the account of uh, biography of, of uh, Mahavira, the text always mention uh, the season, the month, uh, the time of the day or night, uh, the exact moment when something happened. These are exactly the same things which any astrologer would need, and these were the same things which Ajivikas did for living. Mahavira himself also tells the future on few occasions, but even in the same text of uh, Vyahapannati, chapter 15, where Gosala, the story of Gosala is narrated, uh, at the end of the text, Mahavira will tell the future of Gosala, what would happen with Gosala. So we see that basically Mahavira does, exact, does exactly the same what the Ajivikas did. Uh, again, it's a weak ar argument, but I would say there is a, an influence of Ajivika tradition of divination on Jainism. I come back to Mahanimitas. We have some evidence that the Jains and the Ajivikas had some, perhaps not necessarily common set of scriptures, but at least certain common tradition to which they referred. One is the account from the Bhagavati Sutra, Vihapanati. Uh, the Ajivikas, as I've said, are mentioned to have had Maharnimitta, eight books uh, of omens. Interestingly, these eight books of omens are said to be included in the Puvvas, or ancient texts, Purvas, very well known in Jainism. These texts for the Jains disappeared. Of course, uh, since any work of the Ajivikas disappeared, also these Purvas also disappeared. But interestingly, the, the title of the scr early scr scriptures for Jains and Ajivikas is the same, Purvas. The Jains never bother to mention that these purvas were distinct from giant purvas. Normally, they would rather take a step back and say, well, the name is the same, but it is not the same as our text. In a later text, Nandi Sutra, we find an interesting description of the canon. Uh, it's a longer passage, but I think quite interesting because it shows that the giants were pretty aware of the fact that the structure of early Jain canon and the structure of early Ajivika canon was the same, with some important distinctions. 
22 sutras are accepted to be the sutras in the arrangement of our own system, the Jainon, the sections of which are independent for meaning on each other. That is, each section is an independent work in itself. 22 sutras are accepted to be the sutras in the arrangement of Ajivika sutras, the sections of which are dependent for meaning on each other. 22 sutras are accepted to be sutras in the arrangement of Trairashika sutras, the sections of which form three groups. 22 sutras are accepted to be the sutras in the arrangement of our own system, the sections of which, are, uh, of which reflect four viewpoints. In this manner, they are together with the first one and the last one, eight, eight sutra, 88 sutras. This passage analyzes the structure of Jain and Ajivika canon and shows that basically the structure is the same. Uh, it is, I think, quite telling uh, that, the, that the Jains do this comparison. Uh, the item one and four refer to Jain sutras. The item two and three refer to Ajivikas. Ajivikas who are very often called Trairashikas. I will come to Trairashikas in a moment. And this will concern Jain logic. Now, we have clear indications that Jains and Ajivikas had uh, a, some common set of cosmology. Ajivikas believed, at least Gosala is reported to speak of eight finalities, eight final things which await everyone before death. I will focus on the last one, number eight. There, Gosala is said to express the view that he is the last Ford maker, the last Tirthankara, out of 24 Tirthankaras of this uh, ascending era. Uh, era. Avasarpini. That shows that Ajivikas believed in 24 Tirthankaras. They believed also in the sinusoidal development of cosmos. From Avasarpini, Utsar, uh, so, uh, this is descending, Avasarpini, sorry, this is a mistake. Uh, descending and ascending uh, eras in the development of the world. Now, there is another very interesting passage in the Bhagavati Sutra. Uh, Sutra. At the beginning of the career, ascetic career, Gosala is said to come up with an idea. I quote, thereupon I, Mahavira, Mahavira reports in the first person, I lived together with Gosala Manghaliputta through temporary wakefulness for six years on the ground of a bartered place, bazaar, experiencing gain, loss, pleasure, pain, treatment, uh, good and bad treatment, good treatment and bad treatment. That happens in the period of six years when they live together as, ascet uh, as ascetics. However, before the story begins, we are reported that Gosala Manghaliputta teaches the following six unavoidable things. I quote, then Gosala Manghaliputta, having extracted the gist from these great omens in eight canonical books, by merely taking a casual glance into their contents, he teaches the following six unavoidable contingencies that, that befall all creatures. All beings, all souls, all living beings name, uh, experience gain, loss, pleasure, pain, life, and death. Out of these six, of course, uh, only four could be experienced as long as Mahavira and Gosala lived. They could experience gain, loss, pleasure, and pain. Uh, life, birth will come next. Death will come next. So it's interesting that uh, Mahavira says that he experienced four things out of six which were previously taught by Gosala. That means he recounts the teaching of Gosala. Um, now I come to logic, which is the main subject. But I needed this introduction to talk how Jainism now, in my opinion, began, and what was the relationship between Ajivikas and the Jains, early relation, so that we better understand how logic and interest in epistemology started in Jainism. We are used to the fact that the Jains operate with the three basic, or sometimes four basic figures, Syad Asti, Syad Nasti, Syad Avaktaviam, Syad Asti, Nasti. 
Um, however, it is quite interesting that this structure does not appear in early giant writings. It is not there. The giants, early giants, would operate with two figures. But, uh, yeah, so this model is basically absent in early giant writings. What we have is P and not P. For instance, Lokach, Alokach, Jiva, Ajiva, but never a combination of these two. To give you an example, um, from Taranga Sutta. One is soul, one is punishment, one is action, one is world, one is non-world. Then, uh, first we have P, then the next chapter says, whatever is there in this world, it falls under two uh, words, namely, living element jiva, the lifeless element ajiva, the movable, movable being and the immovable being, space and non-space. Righteousness, unrighteousness. So we have the, these pairs, jiva, ajiva, akasha, no akasha, dharma, adharma, bandha, moksha, abandha. However, we do not have the next step when we would have that one is soul, there, there is jiva, there is jiva, ajiva, and there is jiva, ajiva, and a combination of these two. This does not appear. The text goes on in these counts and only adds new elements. So it is not P, non-P, P and not P, but it is the pattern is P, Q, R. Or P, non-P, R and so on. Basically it's quite consistent in earliest strata of giant canon. This is a separate question, what is earliest? Now the same pattern is found in this early collection of Jain hymns, Isi Bhasi Yain. <laughs> this is, in fact, that portion ascribed to Parshva. He is reported to say, what is this world? Is it living element jiva or the lifeless element ajiva? What is its course? Gati. What is, what is, of, what is the course of living beings and of matter particles? Sorry, what is of living beings and of matter Particles that is called course. What is the course? Courses of living beings and matter particles with respect to substance, with respect to place, with respect to time, with respect to condition. What is the condition of the course? The condition of the world is beginningless, endless, transforming. We again have the trace of this pattern P and not P, jiva and ajiva. And again, it is not extended to jiva, ajiva, and jiva, ajiva. It is the pattern P, non P, Q, and so on. Basically, this is the same pattern which we find in all other elegiant texts. Um, however, we are used to this kind of pattern, P, non P, P, and not P, and so on. This is typical of Syadvada. Where does this pattern come from then? Mm, okay, I'll skip this. Perhaps before I give the answer where this pattern comes from, I will mention one more important thing. In reply, perhaps I'll go back to this. No, it's, it's not here. In reply to one of these questions, I don't list them all because it's a longer passage. Uh, the question is, uh, sorry, the answer speaks of different uh, viewpoints. It says, with respect to substance, oh, sorry, uh, oh yeah. with respect, the world is discussed with respect to substance, place, time, and condition. Perhaps, Historically, this may be the earliest mention of the canonical nikshepas. I would claim, since it is associated with Parshva, perhaps Parshva was the one 
who really introduced this uh, division. Mm. This is a part which, uh, ah, there is one more important element. Question three, which is not, yeah, it's mentioned here. The question three runs, whose is the, the world? The world in its own condition with respect to ownership belongs to living beings. With respect to its development, it belongs to living elements and lifeless elements. The word here used is paduccia, with respect to. It goes back probably to similar usage of pratitya in Buddhist canon, pratitya samutpada, for instance. But it's interesting, again, we have the same method. When something is discussed with respect to its own condition, ownership, and so on. Again, this is still the same account of Parshva. I would call this the beginnings of perspectivism in Jainism. That is, the approach that we analyze something with respect to ownership, with respect to substance, with respect to time, and so on. Uh, I'll oh, perhaps this. Oh, I think. Yes, there is an interesting example. Um, where in another giant work, things, in fact, causes are discussed. I will read it and then comment it. Causes are explained to be five, namely one cognizes a cause, with a cause, one sees a cause, with a cause, one understand, understands a cause, or with a cause, one adopts a cause, one dies a death of a person in the stage of bondage, with, which is a cause, and so on. Causes are explained to be five, namely, one does not cognize a cause, one dies a death of an ignorant person. The pattern, it's a longer passage, I don't repeat it. Next step, non-causes are explained to be five, namely, one cognizes non-cause, one dies a death of an omniscient person, and so on. Next step, non-causes are explained to be five, namely, one does not cognize a non-cause. In fact, this passage shows that we have two binaries, hetu, that is cause, and janati, cognizes. These two things, two elements, are uh, permuted. So if we say V is verb, H is hetu, cause, then these are all possible permutations. There are two elements which are permuted. Again, this is a device which we find in Jain canon early uh, sections. Um, again, we have only two binaries, not three elements. But we see that Jains from the beginning liked to use a term, its negation, combine it perhaps with a verb and its negation, and permute and check for all possibilities. I will later try to say why. Now, I come, come back to Ajivikas. Ajivikas are sometimes called terasiya, that is trairashika. Rashi means heap. Uh, in this context, it means an option. Those who had three options, or three figures, we could say. These three options, three figures are jiva, ajiva, and jiva, ajiva. This is the combination. Uh, of these elements. One element, its negation, and then combination of these two. This is, as I emphasized, does not come to view in early Jain canon. The description of Trairashika pops up very seldom. The best known is this from Nandi Sutra. I will read this whole passage. The accepted computational schemes are seven. Six are originally systemic. The sixth one is that of the Ajivikas. It's interesting that canonical works often refer to the Ajivikas and take them by sort of kind of authority, which is perhaps on the side, but still Ajivikas pop up here, not the Buddhists. There are six computational schemes based on quadripartite viewpoints. 
There are seven ones of the Trairashika. Such are computa computational schemes. That doesn't tell us much, but that's the introduction to the commentary. Out of these seven computational schemes, the first six computa computational schemes are our own systemic, which means they have been propounded in their own doctrine. The Ajivikas are heretics led by Goshala. According to their systemic view, seven computa computational schemes are distinguished and dealt with the vanished or deceased, and the not vanished, not deceased. That's a long discussion what it means. There are three angled perspectives in the computa computational scheme. Comprehensive viewpoint, Naigama, is twofold. Collected and uncollected. The collected viewpoint is again twofold, identical and concurring. The uncollected viewpoint is empirical, Vyavahara, collective, empirical, direct, and so on. With the help, uh, it goes direct viewpoint, verbal viewpoint, and so on. With the help of these four viewpoints, uh, the six, our own systemic uh, computational schemes are conceived. This quote shows, ah, the quote, it goes on. Now, uh, well, perhaps it's the same text, but another, same Nandi Sutra, but another section. And precisely these were expounded by the Ajivikas, the Trairashikas. Why? It is explained. Because of the whole world, of the whole world existence is taken to be tripartite, namely the living element, jiva, the lifeless element, ajiva, and both the living element compounded with the lifeless element, jiva, ajiva. Similarly, it is world, non-world, and both the world compounded with the non-world, loka, aloka. And then we have sat, asat, and sad, asat, existent, non-existent, and existent plus non-existent. All these viewpoint perspectives are accepted as tripartite viewpoint, namely substance expressive, dravya artika or dravya astika, dravya artika in, in, in Prakrit, mode expressive, duality expressive. That is why it is said in the sutra, there are seven ones of the trairashikas. We see that trairashikas, the ajivikas, used nayas, seven nayas. And these nayas consisted or were based on this tripartite scheme, P, non-P, and P and non-P, which would seem superfluous. Um, there was a debate, someone claimed that these passages were uh, mm, mm, a result of a wrong reading of the manuscripts. But we have the confirmation from other texts that the Trirashikas did exist, that they are followers of Go Goshala. This is a Sri Lanka commentary on uh, Suyagadanga, Sutra Kritanga. He says, uh, thus this Trirashika, a follower of Goshala system being refuted, argues in another manner. So we have the term Trirashika in other parts of the giant canon. I would say Uh, before I go to the next part, I would say that this is the sort of these three figures in Jainism. Ajivikas must have remained in close contact with the Jains, early Jains, for some longer time. Perhaps also even at the time of uh, Ashoka, these contacts were very close. Um, Trairashikas was a name used for Ajivikas by the Jains. Apparently, it was very significant at that time for the Jains. And the Jains themselves must have regarded the name to be significant. They knew that the name denotes these three options, P, non-P, and P and non-P. Jiva, Ajiva, and Jiva, Ajiva. Had at that period of time they thought that Ajivikas follow the same procedure as the Jains, they would have portrayed Ajivikas as simply followers of some Jain inventions. But Ajivikas are portrayed as original in their views. And this is why they were called Trairashikas. There is one more interesting case in the account of the Bhagavati Sutra, which, in my opinion, will point to the fact that Goshala himself probably may have used this pattern. 
Goś Bhagavati Sutra w Yahapanati narrates the last dates, uh, days of Goshala. He is portrayed there as a victim of his own pride and his own uh, misuse of this ascetic heat which he, with which he wants to kill or damage Mahavira. That rebounds and Goshala is hit back by that heat and he doesn't know that. Then he suffers a lot, he goes into a delirium for seven days and towards the end of the seventh night of this delirious fever, he is described to regain his senses and repent. He says the following, I am not a victor, proclaimed as victor. Liberated, proclaimed as liberated. Omniscient, proclaimed as omniscient. I am Maskarin Goshala, who destroys ascetics, who kills ascetics. This is uh, what he, this, the way he repents. And then he, immediately afterwards, he says, through numerous cases of my adherence to falsehood, when I communicated inexistent things, I led astray, betrayed, and separated from the community, myself and others, and both myself and others, now being pervaded with my own firepower, being at the end of seventh night, being overcome with heat with my own body, seized with the bilious fever, I will die a death of a person in the stage of bondage. I emphasize the, this expression, myself and others, and then we have a compound, myself and others. This is precisely this tripartite form, P, not P, and P and not P. We could say that this pattern perhaps is nothing unusual because in, pra in Sanskrit in practice it would be Atman para tad ubhaya. However, when we search for this pattern in the whole text of Vyahapanati, we don't find it. We find just four cases, except for this one, which are definitely inserted, they are later insertions because they discuss very complex cosmological issues. So nowhere in this text we find an expression similar to this one, when someone says of myself, others, and myself and others. This never comes, except for this single passage. Um, we could say that uh, this pattern is innocuous. It just, it is a mode of expression. However, I would say, since this pattern is associated closely with later Ajivika tradition, in this context it is quite meaningful. It is a remnant of the original way in which Gosala described events, or things, from time to time at least. Now, I come to another interesting point, Salekhana, a very well-known practice from Jainism. I would again claim it is not a Jain tradition, originally. Um, this is an interesting passage. Uh, Gosala, before his death, proclaims some other things. He speaks of four drinkables and four undrinkables, or substitute, substitutes for liquids. He says, what are the drinkables? There are four drinkables known, namely water, which has touched earth, water which has been soiled with earth by hand, water which has come, been heated by the heat of a kiln, which has dropped down from the stone of a potter's wheel. What are the undrinkables? There are four undrinkables known, namely the simulation of a drink uh, of a vessel, this, that is someone holds a cold vessel. The simulation of a drink of a fruit skin, the examples given, important is mango skin. And Gosala is re reported as portrayed as someone who uh, keeps a mango skin in his mouth before dying. The simulation of a drink of kidney bean. The simulation of a drink of pure substances. I will come back to these four drinkables and undrinkables. They, in my opinion, are very significant. But then he goes on to describe each of these. This is a lengthy past passage, but I will select just one. The last fourth of these undrinkables, that is the simulation of a drink of pure substances runs as follows. One eats pure food for six months. Within this period of six months, for two months, he approaches the bed of earth, that is, he sleeps on earth, on, on ground. For two months, he approaches the bed of wood. 
he sleeps on wooden beds, probably. For two months, he approaches the bed of grass. Uh, of grass. On the last night of these six months, completed in full extension, these two divine beings of mighty supernatural powers, known as mighty lords, namely Purnabhadra and Manibhadra, appear near him. Then these two gods, with cold and moist hands, touch, caress the members of his body. The one who succumbs to these two gods, that is, who enjoys this cool touch, induces the karma suffering within the serpent hood. If, if the one who does not succumb to these two gods, within his own physical body, a fire body originates. He burns his uh, physical body with his own fire produced by the fire body. After this physical body has been burned, he attains perfection, that is, he succeeds, and he dies. This is the drink of the pure substances. In fact, in my opinion, this is the way how an Ajivika monk dies. Dies first in fact, he dies of dehydration. He doesn't take any liquids. Uh, the mango skin was probably something, because of its sour taste, something which alleviated the th uh, thirst for someone who wanted to drink. And the difference was that Salekhana, giant Salekhana, is death by starvation. Ajivikas practice death by dehydration, a shorter period. Again, I would say, this is an Ajivika influence, even for chronological reasons. Gosala dies much earlier than Mahavira, and he dies this way, of dehydration, of not drinking, because of not drinking. Now, um, we see that for drinkables and undrinkables, water is used in different ways. These four drinkables are described as, as something which provides protection against evil for forces, against sansara, against also demons who, which would like to draw one back into sansara. And the application first of water and then of these uh, substitutes for water is supposed to play an important role to alleviate pain to, and also to keep one on the right track of asceticism, not to succumb to demons. I would say this is a link which may explain a very cryptic passage of Samanya Palasutta. This is the passage, well known, uh, a well known description of, uh, of, of Mahavira, uh, Nigantha, uh, who is described there in the following way. Now, O king, there is an ascetic, free from all bonds, who lives restrained by the uh, restraint of four controls. And who is, O king, such an ascetic who lives restrained by the restraint of four, fourfold control? He is, O king, the ascetic free from all bonds, is covered by all water, warded off by all water, protected by all water, who is touched by all water. This was or is a cryptic passage, and basically it, is, it has been cryptic to all Buddhologists, to all Indologists, and also to Buddha Gosa, who had problems to commend. But I would say this is not a description of Mahavira. This is a description of Gosala. The second description of Gosala, or at least someone who followed the path of Gosala, of Ajivikas. Because of these four waters, for drinkables or for undrinkables, these four, water occurs in the passage four times, exactly the same as four times it occurs in the description of drinkables and undrinkables. Even in the commentary, Abhayadeva Suri uses a term udakavarakam. This is something, someone who uh, protects himself with water. So there is even uh, a terminological overlap, at least in one case. So I would say this would explain this cryptic passage of Samanya Palasutta. I'll skip this perhaps because I should finish soon. I cannot leave the most important concept which Peter already mentioned, niyati, determinism. This is the concept closely associated with the Ajivikas. In fact, in many means, those who profess determinism. I don't have time to 
deal with this topic in itself, which is quite interesting. But there are at least two cases of determinism in Jainism. There are many more, but these are quite problematic for the Jains. One is the well-known distinction of Bhavya and Abhavya souls. Bhavya souls are those souls who by nature are capable of reaching liberation. Abhavya souls are, on the contrary, the souls which by nature are not capable of reaching liberation. Never, ever. They are doomed to be in samsara. It is not about the simple fact that some souls will never reach. But the Jains, by talking about Abhavya soul, emphasize that these are not capable by nature of reaching moksha. There are discussions, uh, and in these discussions, of course, the option is there that Bhavya souls, that is, that they may never reach liberation, but not uh, for any other reason. They simply will never follow the right track. But they are, st even though they will never reach liberation, they are always capable of reaching, because such is their nature. However, other souls, by nature, are not capable of doing this. This is a very problematic case for the Jains because usually it, it was either neglected but by Jain thinkers, put aside, or commented in a very awkward manner. It was problematic. How to explain that Jainism defines certain living beings as those not capable of reaching liberation? No doctrinal explanation was ever given for that. I would say this is again a remnant of Ajivikan determinism, of the concept of niyati. Another interesting case is the idea of a karman called nikachita karman, karman which is unalterable. The Jains normally say that all karman can be destroyed or its fruition can take place at a desired moment, it can be speeded up. Of course, it's very important for someone who, uh, for a Tirthankara, someone, a Tirthankara to be. There are always some karmans which will keep an individual in the world, and even though someone has the potential to reach re re liberation, will not be able to do it because of some dormant karmans. So it is important that these karmans can be eliminated or the fruition uh, may come about quicker. However, there is one strange variety in Jainism, precisely this kind of karma, and it is explained as the one, this is from Gomata uh, Sara, the karma known as deposited or tight bound, which is dormant, cannot be operated by any action in fruition, both delay and fruition, in all four karmic states. So whatever one does, this cannot be changed. And it seems this is precisely the same argument used by the Ajivikas. There was a paper by Johannes Bronkhorst who a few years ago discussed this issue. And I completely agree. This is the way Ajivikas understood karma. That the karma, once it is there, we have to experience it in full. And this is the remnant of that karma in, in Jainism. Now, there is... Do I have still time? Five minutes? What to do? <laughs> um, I'm usually too talkative. Last time when I was there, I again extended my paper, which was supposed to be for 20 minutes, I think, to 40 minutes. But I promise it will not be double this time. <laughs> um, the in interesting question, what about Saptabhangi? The idea which we now associate with Jainism. Is it Jain or Ajivika? Um, what are the origins of this? Now, there is a place in Jain canon, a, a passage which I would say reflects uh, how this concept was developed. It's at the end of, the one, of one of the chapters. End of chapters are very important. Uh, like Moksha Dharma Parvan is a very good example. End of chapters are usually dustbins. You drop dust, you drop rubbish. The oldest parts are oldest. I mean, the, whatever comes first is oldest. And every new layer is a new material. 
like in a dustbin. And this is, in fact, this passage, in my opinion, is such a dustbin which preserves a certain development. This passage runs as follows. I will cut it short because it's very long. O oh, Venerable, is soul cognition or something else is cognition? This is a question posed by uh, Gautama to Mahavira. Gautama, soul could be cognition, could be non-cognition. However, cognition is necessarily soul. Venerable, is soul of hellish beings cognition or something of hellish beings is cognition? Gautama, soul, is, soul of hellish beings could be cognition, could be non-cognition. However, cognition is necessarily soul. O Venerable, is soul of earth-bodied beings, that is, one-sensed beings, non-cognition or something of earth-bodied beings is non-cognition? Gautama, soul of earth-bodied beings is necessarily non-cognition. Could be, it could be non-cognition, and non-cognition is necessarily soul. And there are other cases discussed. This is an older section where we have two elements, P and not P. But what is interesting, Sia comes to play, that is Siat. It is perhaps the first time historically where we have the beginnings of Siat Vada. It is only, we have just two possibilities discussed. Next section, or next sub-chapter of the same section, that is the new layer of the dustbin, says, O Venerable, is soul the land of Ratnaprabha, that is the centermost part of the world, or something else is the land of Ratnaprabha? Gautama, the land of Ratnaprabha could be soul, could be non-soul, could be inexpressible, soul as well non-soul. O Venerable, in what sense was it says? Uh, was it said, Gautama, soul is mentioned with respect to itself, non-soul is mentioned with respect to something else. Inexpressible is mentioned with respect to both. The land of Ratna Prabha is soul as well it is non-soul. It is in the sense that it was said, and so on. This is the next sub-chapter of the same chapter. The matters discussed are not very simple, jiva ajiva but they are much more complex. They concern cosmology and rather complex cosmology. Uh, I don't have time to describe why the centermost part of the world was important. In fact, it overlaps with the structure of human body. I would refer you to one of, to my paper on Loka Purusha, where it is described in the history of this concept. So we have in this section the follow, following elements. We have this optative, siya or siyat. It is a cupola at first. It is it connects. X may be or could be P. X may be or could be non-P. And then the, the next option, X may be inexpressible. And we have also the three bhangas. Atman, no Atman, and inexpressible. Soul, non-soul, inexpressible. We have, again, interesting element, no Atman, in other cases, we are used to know as a neg negation particle in Jainism, which is used side by side with a. But here it is quite meaningful, not only for grammatical or phonetical reasons no is used, but in other cases no is also used. It is used apparently to distinguish uh, the other option from simple negation, like jiva, a jiva. This text will no longer say jiva, but will say no jiva. Why? That's a different question. And another one more important element is this introduction of the perspective. It is with respect to. It's expressed here by aditya, with genitive. Again, this is an element which will later develop into full siadvada. There are, in this longer chapter, there are more refinements. Uh, it's chapter 12, in fact, of Bhagavati Sutra. If siya, the siyat, atma, Siat no atma, siat avaktaviam, and you see there are many, uh, a lot of play with these elements. They are not exhausted here. Perhaps I don't have time, so I will skip this too. Um, I will also mention uh, again this work which I mentioned a few times today, Isi uh, Bhasiyaim. It may probably be a later 
layer of this text. But the text also says the following thing. Taking refuge, I honor the worlds of Lord Gina, which are profound, wholesome in all aspects, radiant with reasons, aspects, uh, reasons hetu, aspects banga, perhaps refutations, and viewpoints, naya. It may preserve again a very early uh, strata when these concepts appear for the first time. Now, a few words about the beginnings of Jain logic. I'm steering towards conclusions. Um, as I've said, Jains were not interested in logic at all. They were not interested in inferences at all. We don't find such cases. They were interested in analyzing things from different perspectives. That is true. The earliest mention of pramana, that is this cognitive tool, means of valid cognition, or which I call uh, cognitive criteria, is rather late, and it is clearly uh, a borrowing from the tradition of Anvikshiki and Nyaya. Anvikshiki, again, is a tradition with, which disappeared, but in one of the books which are there uh, on display, Worldview and Theory in Indian Philosophy, you will find a very long chapter how Nyaya Vaishishika started. It goes back to Anvikshiki. So Anvikshiki was the system from which the Jains borrowed the idea of pramana. They, uh, this earliest classification of pramanas in Jain canon uh, mentions four. Pratyaksha, that is perception, inference, anumana, analogy, aupamya, upamana, and scriptural testimony, agama. At first they are called hetu. The Jains did not use the idea of, of pramana, but later on, they also adopted the term pramana. Probably the source for the Jains was the milieu closely related to Charaka Sanhita. That was the milieu related also to the Anvikshiki tradition. Also, the Jains took the scheme of inference from this tradition of Anvikshiki, Nyaya, and Vaisheshika. The earliest enumerations mention or follow the five-membered proof formula, Pancha Avayava Vakya. We have the thesis Pratijna, the logical reason had to, the example Drishtanta, application Upanayana, and conclusion Nigamana. They were also, the giants worked with that. They developed a scheme of 10-membered proof formulas. That was originally giant. But the incentive was not giant, it was a borrowing from another system. Now, uh, one more interesting element uh, about Anekanta Vada. Perhaps Johannes Bronkers will tell us more about that. Um, I would say the Ajivikas used this term too. There is a cryptic work ascribed to Siddhasena Divakara. It is in a collection of 21 Dvatrinshikas works in 32 uh, verses. One of these has a title, Niyati Dvatrinshika. Oleg Farnstrom once, three, four years ago, yeah, you were talking about this work as an epic, uh, em emic, emic work of the Ajivikas, uh, um, which survived thanks to giants. I spoke about this work and ana analyzed it also closely and spoke about this in, in a seminar last year in Japan, I would say it is not an Ajivika work. It was written for various reasons by a Jain who had some knowledge of the Ajivikas, but this work is also important for us because it does preserve certain Ajivikan terminology. There is an interesting verse here. I'll read it in translation. If true knowledge of the Ajivikan victorious genus is tantamount to inevitability, that is determinism, then one should not make an exertion. In other words, if you are determined to become a jina, why should you practice asceticism? This is the well-known argument used against the ajivikas. Now also, if in the case of ajivikan jinas, the true knowledge is multiplex, anekanta, they are not omniscient from one point of view and omniscient, that they are omniscient from one point of view and not omniscient from another, then these jinas, in fact, are already vanquished. That is, they will never become liberated. That is, 
if they are really on a counter, so even at the state of the omniscience, they should be also not omniscient. Yeah, this is, again, John Arthur uses this argument against Ajivikas, an argument which is later on used by Vedanta against the, uh, the Jains themselves. If that is so, where is the lord of the Ajivikas as an authority? Is, there is no jina of the Ajivikas. The text preserves this expression, anakanta, which I, I would say is not a coincidence. There are some more expressions which we associate with anakanta vada in this text. Sad asat atmakam, something the nature of which is both existent and non-existent. Similarly here, dharma adharma atmakatwe. If some things by nature are both righteous and not righteous. Jiva ajiva again occurs there. And there are some more. Oh, these are examples. One more thing. Uh, there is a certain echo in Buddhist sources. But, okay. <laughs> um, this is the last thing before conclusions. <laughs> in, in, in Pali texts, in two texts of the Pali Canon, we find a discussion of different things. It is just an example. One section says, a verdict in the presence of, that is someone who, whose behavior should be judged, may be skilled, it may be indeterminate. Uh, sorry, this is the first question above. Is a verdict in the presence of skilled, in the presence of someone to be judged, skilled, unskilled, or indeterminate? Is a decision of the majority skilled, unskilled, indeterminate? Uh, indeterminate? And the answer is, a verdict in the presence of the person may be skilled, it may be indeterminate, there is no unskilled verdict in the presence of. And then, the decision of the majority may be skilled, it may be unskilled, it may be indeterminate. It sounds like an echo of Anakanta Vada, but I don't have time to show that probably it is a natural development within Buddhism. There are some more things to say, but I will go to conclusions. Um, first of all, which I've mentioned already before, we should remember that probably the relation between Gosala and, Makali, uh, Gosala and Mahavira was the other way around. For some time, for some period of time, Mahavira was a disciple of Gosala. Then they went apart. Jainism was or is a tradition which combined three different strands. One was that of Mahavira, one of Parshva, the other one was of Goshala. Some elements of Goshala teaching are still present in Jainism. Um, this explains this close relation be between Ajivikas and, and naked Jains, because we should remember that not every giant monk was naked, explains why Buddhists found it so confusing and very often they referred with the same term to both Digambar monks, so-called Digambar, and Ajivika, sometimes we don't know. Simply for the Buddhists, these two traditions, the tradition of the Ajivikas and naked giant ascetics was more or less the same. Um, it is most probable that the whole idea of Nikshepa, that is viewpoints, goes back to Parshva himself or his tradition. This is why we have all these expressions that something is such and such with respect to substance, with respect to time, with respect to place, with respect to condition. Mahavira was not really interested in epistemology in any way. These ep epistemological elements probably come from the Ajivikas, from his teacher, Koshala. Ajivikas were responsible for bringing into Jainism these three options, P, non-P, and P and non-P. Now, many authors in the past said the following, as Basham did. The Ajivikas 
seem to have accepted the basic principle of Jaina epistemology without going to the over-refined extreme of Saptabhangi, as in the orthodox Jaina, Syadvada, and Nayavada. In fact, this is wrong. Of course, the Jains refined the concept of Saptabhangi, but the origins of that are or belong to Ajivikas. Ajivikas brought into that idea the, these three options, possibilities. The Jains added siat, something may be. In the beginning, it was just a, uh, a connective verb, connecting the subject with object. Later on, it developed uh, into a particle. Um, now, perhaps this is a final remark. We may ask how Saptabhangi started at all. I think the context was ethical or moral. These were moral considerations. Both Ajivikas and Jains put emphasis on ahinsa, on non-harming, non-injury to living beings. But it was very important to define what is a living being and in what respect. Many discussions in Jain canon open with discussions like Tananga Sutra, Sutra uh, Suyagadanga. They open up with lists. What is, what is Jiva? What is Ajiva? What is Loka? These three terms usually occur. Loka is understood as a place where living beings live. Simply, it was not about the universe, but about the world, the space where living beings are. So these three terms are discussed precisely for ethical reasons. A Jain or Ajivika monk had to be sure which path is safe, which one is not safe. And I would say the beginnings of Jain logic are in, in ethical moral considerations. Thank you very much. <laughs>